Our gospel for today comes from Luke uh, chapter 15, verses 11 through 20, and it's found on page 60 in your New Testament if you'd like to follow along. Hear the good news for this day. <coughs> then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. <clears throat> but when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to share? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he sent off, went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. This is our good news for this day. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our devotional that uh, many of you have been following along uh, with keys us into one phrase from this story that we know so well, this prodigal son story. But when he came to himself, it happens as nothing more than a transition in the story, but it means everything to the story and everything to our story. Faith is more or less the story of coming to ourselves or coming to God or allowing God to come to us. But however the wording goes, the truth is the same. At some point, we must come to ourselves, awaken to something better, bigger, grander, more than this world, something eternal. When I started trying to think about what I wanted to say for my sermon, I had the flash of an idea. But I immediately thought, no, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> you already think I'm weird enough as it is. What with talking about ghosts and talking about times when I've felt the Holy Spirit speak through me, different experiences of miracles that I've had. At this point, you probably think I'm either a very strange person or a person that doesn't tell the truth. And that's when it hit me. Well, if you already think that, how can it get any worse? <laughs> you see, there's an oddity to faith. We all want to experience God, right? We want to hear about someone's experience of God, someone's experience of the more that is waiting out there in this world. But when that experience goes beyond what we're used to, what we expect, what we allow ourselves to come to, we tend to think that person that experienced that oddity has something wrong with them. Or at least that's our initial suspicion. And I'll tell you right now, God is not normal. God doesn't do predictable. So I'm going to tell you the story that I think I shouldn't tell you. But I want you to know that it actually happened. And that it's God's fault that I'm on. It's the story of why I don't meditate anymore. Or why I don't meditate in a traditional way anymore. Now, I know all of you have uh, different views on meditation. Some people think it's a great mental exercise, 
while other people see it as a great way to connect to God and allow God to speak to us, while still others think it's a waste of a good nap. <laughs> I've gone through different periods of my life where I did a little or a lot of meditation. For one three-month period, I got up every morning at 5 a.m. and meditated for an hour. I was miserable. As soon as I was done with my three-month commitment that I made to myself to meditate for an hour every morning, I stopped for a really, really long time. Another time I spent a week at a monastery using their comfy pillows to get deeper into meditation and promptly fell asleep each time on their super comfy pillows. I don't think those monks meditate, those pillows are too soft. <laughs> But the last time I really meditated in the traditional way is what I'm going to tell you about. Most meditations begin with breathing, controlling your breathing, following your breathing, calming your breathing. There's an endless variety of things you do after that, after you've controlled your breath. But that's where meditation generally begins. Then the goal is more or less to clear your mind. Now, a lot of people stop there, if they ever get there. Stop at clearing your mind. But a friend of mine is a Buddhist scholar. And the last time I talked to her about meditation, she went on a rant. That's what scholars do, they go on rants. Uh, about how people shouldn't stop, that shouldn't stop at clearing your mind, because that's only meant to be the beginning. From the clearing of your mind, we are meant to journey out and discover things about ourselves and our condition and the world around us. As I nodded along while my Buddhist scholar friend ranted about proper meditation, because that's what you do when a scholar goes on a rant, you, mm -hmm. <laughs> But while I was nodding, I realized I'd never really tried that, to go beyond the clearing of the mind to anything. So after my scholar friend returned home, and after I carved out some spare time, which is harder to do these days, I decided to see what happened if I tried to go somewhere after I cleared my mind. Now something you should know about me is that when I meditate, it doesn't take me long to clear my mind. And this is where the joke comes. It doesn't take long to clear a mind when there's nothing there. <laughs> But generally, after spending so much of my life meditating, I can simply tell myself to clear my mind, and my mind is clear. So on this particular day of this particular story, I cleared my mind. And from within that, I started to look around with my eyes closed. Look around at myself, at the world around me. And that's when I noticed a beam of light stretching out above me. Keep in mind, I'm not seeing this, but I'm seeing it. I don't want to describe it other than there was a beam of light, and it was inviting, it was blinding. I felt like I was glowing, so I followed in my mind this light. And I went up and up and up and out into a feeling. I won't say a place, because that doesn't exactly uh, do it justice, but it came to a feeling of endless peace. Endless love, endless contentment. Without acknowledging it, I knew that I was in a timeless place. I know that because I began to unravel all thoughts, all questions. It felt like years were spent in that moment conversing with something, someone much greater and grander than myself. And from within that place, I found that I had no intention of ever leaving. And this is the reality of why I'm sharing this story with you, why I'm risking the odd glances that you might be tempted to give me right now, and why I don't meditate like that anymore. As I was dwelling in that place of perfect contentment, an errant thought hit me. I remember asking myself, I wonder what Beckett is doing right now. <laughs> and in that moment, I came to myself. I remember that I'm a father with children, 
I'm a husband with a wife. I'm a person with a continuing life. And I realized that even though I didn't want to, I needed to go back. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't had that thought about Beckett, my son, and what he was doing. And I definitely had to struggle with everything that I had in that place to return to the world I had left behind. I have not gone back, <coughs> meditated in that way again, because I know how hard it was for me. I returned to find that almost no time had passed, even though it felt like I had been gone years. But it was eye-opening, a jaw-dropping experience of the beyond. One that made me realize how difficult at times it is to come to ourselves as the prodigal son did. <clears throat> this prodigal son story is an odd one. Because there's no other story like it from that time period. Not one. There's no other story from that location like it. Not one. There is no tradition of asking for your share of the inheritance before your father has passed because to do so was unthinkable. Because in that time period, that was to say one thing to your father. I wish you were no longer living. That is where the story of this prodigal son begins, with a boy whose mind is like that, that says the cruelest possible words to his father. And he got what he wanted. Riches, travel, whatever we might read into dissolute living. He got that. He got the life that he thought he wanted, the life that he thought he needed until he came to himself. The allure of that other life is difficult to overcome, even if we read some potential positive into whether, whatever our other life might be. Our gospel tells us, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. We don't always realize what we are hungering for in this world. What truly can feed us. What we are placed here to eat. But when we come to ourselves, whether that is our true self or a God-focused self or a new faith, when we come to ourselves, there is no longer the worry of shame disappeared here. Or the desires of endless greed it's disappeared here. Or all the trappings of this world, there is only the footsteps as we hurry back to that which will truly feed us. And in that coming to ourselves, we find something greater awaiting while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. The God of all is waiting. The more of life is waiting, waiting for us to come to ourselves, to release all that which does not satisfy and spend our days dwelling in the more that we've been awakened to. It isn't easy. It isn't simple. It doesn't happen in the way you would expect it to happen. And if it does happen, many will find you fundamentally odd, as many of you now find me. But this life is about more than appearances, about more than the life that the world says that we should have, about more than just getting by. When we create the space to come to ourselves, we always find the more of this world, the God of this world, rushing out to greet us. Amen. <laughs>